needed to be prepared. And I should have pushed harder. A lesson I assume you have taken to heart. Sir, I'm the intelligence officer responsible for overseeing the greatest intelligence failure in American history. Close the door. Here I was thinking that we were done making these negative failure videos about 2019 movies, only to be made aware of this hundred million dollar flop of a film called Midway that barely made back half its budget, not even including marketing costs. And the weirdest thing about Midway is that up until watching it with my own eyes last night, I'd never even heard of it. I hadn't heard anyone mention it, I hadn't heard anyone talk about it, I hadn't heard anyone having any opinions about it whatsoever, which for a massive nine digit production today is pretty unheard of. As for what the heck actually happened in order for us to get to this point, I think it's very easy to dismiss Midway as one of those massive visual blockbusters where the massive visual blockbuster portion is not up to par with the highest industry standards. You know, all the big visual stuff here is pure CGI, and the CGI clearly was not made by ILM. But that's such a superficial criticism to make. And truthfully, I don't think that's the real problem that led us here. Truthfully, I'd say the blockbuster the stuff is fine, often even pretty good. There's just something inherently aesthetically striking about the Pacific as a setting and seeing a pack of attack planes fill a smoke-filled sky and tracking with them through clouds for cool reveals. That said, the real actual reason for why Midway became a movie that nobody saw or heard about, I'd say, is because underneath that shell of cool setting and visuals and whatnot, there's nothing. As in, this is the coldest, most heartless, most emotionless movie I think I've ever seen. And the reason I haven't heard any opinions about it is because there is nothing to form an opinion about. It's like a cinematic equivalent of a blank loaf of bread. I mean, it's a blank loaf of bread, what else is there to think or say? And considering that the movie covers what is supposed to be one of the most meaningful events in American military history, much like Dunkirk was for Bryn, how can it be that you see these meaningful events unfold in an adequate visual way and yet you feel nothing? Like, how's that possible? Well, that's what we'll try to figure out. Let's fly over to the world of Midway and see what emotional components it's missing from inside those massive visual events. Let's see how to make a big hollow blockbuster that the audience can generate no feelings for whatsoever, other than forgetfulness. One of the single biggest contributors to why the external visual events in Midway feel so empty and meaningless is because most of the time they're missing the most important emotional component that should give them their emotional potency, the human factor. To explain what I mean, let's look at the opening attack on Pearl Harbor, a real life event which even from a non-American point of view is pretty significant. Essentially, we begin with our hero Patrick Wilson being friends with the Japanese, and then this attack is supposed to hammer in that horrific horrific heartbreaking feeling of the collapse of a friendship and even the betrayal from the Japanese in a sense. So here's how that big horrific heartbreaking event begins. Navy ain't gonna pay you for that. Having seen what you just saw, what do you think is wrong? Well, firstly, there's the fact that the only horrific thing about it is the acting and the editing. We have a swarm of enemy fighters blasting up ships all around and these guys are just standing there like they're in line for 1940 Starbucks. Then we have this guy watching the bombing go on for 10 full seconds only to then scream incoming. Like, no, the incoming already came. But superficial aspects like that aside, the real problem behind all this is the fact that I have to address these characters as these guys and this guy. See, throughout this Pearl Harbor attack, we don't have a single protagonist, not a single human perspective to experience it through. We have these army men there, but we don't know who any of them are, so it doesn't matter. We have this woman and her kid nearby, but we don't know who they are, so it doesn't matter. None of them are introduced to us as people. None of them play any meaningful part in the movie later on. In other words, we're missing the human factor, which means that all we have is the big external event with nothing inside it, which makes
makes this whole event feel like just meaningless noise. The only character we at this point know enough to be able to feel the event through is Patrick Wilson. Having him first be friends with the Japanese commander and then be forced to experience and survive a horrific attack by that same commander he used to call a friend, that could be pretty powerful. So what is this highly powerful moment we get through him? Late in residence. I'll meet you outside. Edwin, what's happening? The Japanese are attacking us. That's right, he's not there to experience the attack. He's not there trying to survive. He's sitting at home and someone calls him to tell it's happening. And once again, the acting is horrible. But not because of the actor, because they have nothing to act with. Because when you have a big external inhuman event at one place and a human perspective at another, most likely neither will have any impact on the audience whatsoever. Don't believe me? Compare this massive Pearl Harbor attack to the much smaller ship attack in Dunkirk. That is told exclusively through a human perspective. Our heroes are there and we also have gone to understand the British soldiers as a whole enough to attach ourselves to them. Watching these attacks back to back, which do you think makes you feel something in a way that you'll remember tomorrow? And it's the same problem throughout the film. We're watching all these massive external inhuman events take place, but we never get a human level sense of the characters we're experiencing them through, or the characters the events might or might not affect. And if you're still not buying the importance of that human factor, take this one last example. Near the midpoint, we have this scene of these random pilots trying to take off from a ship in bad weather. And we have a bunch of characters making bets against our hero, like there's no way they can pull this off. Ten bucks says it'll make Take it off the deck. Yeah, I'll take that bet. And then... But the issue is that after the takeoff succeeds, we just cut to the next scene without ever seeing the reaction of our characters. We never see our hero cheering and being like, I told you so. We never experience this takeoff from anyone's perspective. And therefore, even though visually it seems to be a big heroic positive moment in of itself, we don't really feel that way. And because we aren't guided towards a feeling through character, we don't really feel anything. Another reason behind Midway being such a hollow, forgettable loaf of blank cinematic bread is the fact that there is no all-encompassing feeling that would make it be something specific. For example, seeing this movie is yet another huge role in Emmerich blockbuster, obviously there's gonna be a huge amount of different characters with variating amounts of screen time. And in order to avoid this abundance of character becoming confusing and convoluted, it is crucial to build each character on top of the same connective tissue that ties them all together in a clear way. In Dunkirk, for example, all the characters we spent time with were constructed with elements like time and desperation and pulling off this one impossible miracle. As in, we can remember these people and this movie with a specific thematic feeling. But in Midway, of course, that specific thematic feeling doesn't exist. We have a bunch of people, but nothing that would connect them to anything shared in common. We have our hero pilot Ed Skrine, who's motivated by his blind hatred of the Japanese because in his mind Japanese are all evil. Then we have our friendly intelligence hero Patrick Wilson who exists just to gather good intelligence so that Pearl Harbor can't happen again. Then we also have the Japanese commander who is similarly intelligence oriented like Patrick Wilson but that's where their similarities end. Plus we also have a truckload of different army men who not only share nothing in common but are all basically portrayed just as stereotypical superficial embodiments of their ranks and occupations. No, the fighting spirit of our men and I have faith in them. We'll be the first enemy in Japan's history to hit their home territory. Sorry, Admiral, it uh, gets cold down here in the dungeon. Does this look like a battle wound to you? It's a damn rash. 
The argument you can make is that these are all real people and therefore you can't just go changing who they are. And that's fair. But even if you want to remain respectful to those people and what they're about, that doesn't mean you can't position them around a specific thematic element your movie is about. Looking at Ed Skrine's hatred of the Japanese, for example, it could have been very effective to make this film be all about blind hatred. Have every single prominent character struggle with this philosophical topic of hatred in their own way. Have the Americans hate Japanese because Japanese are evil. Have the Japanese hate Americans because Americans are evil. And then throughout the movie make your main heroes grow to learn that maybe blind hatred isn't so healthy. Maybe there is no definitive good and evil. Maybe there's just people. Or go with Patrick Wilson's intelligence-oriented approach as a theme. Have both him and the Japanese commander struggle to convince their peers and superiors and themselves that gathering intelligence is actually the right thing to do. Just have something to tie this movie and its characters neatly together in a way that makes it clear what thematic lens the audience is viewing it all through. One of the most legendary memorable relationships in all of storytelling is the one between Batman and the Joker. Why is that? Here's why. I knew the mob wouldn't go down without a fight, but this is different. They've crossed the line. Criminals aren't complicated, Alfred. We just need to figure out what he's after. Upset the established order and everything becomes chaos. I'm an agent of chaos. Batman represents order, the Joker represents chaos, which makes them the polar opposite sides of the same coin. And because you know what that coin is, because you know what that relationship is, that's why you remember it. And so if you first inform us that the Japanese attack just because of oil and then have the Americans fight back just because that's what they do, aka have two entirely unrelated thematic perspectives for this war, that's not something the audience can feel for. Because in order for the audience audience to feel, they first need to know what it is they are generating feelings toward. In addition to character and theme, another thing that makes Midway as memorable as the air in front of your eyes is the plot, or lack thereof. Basically, the movie is stuffed with scenes and sequences where we have no idea what purpose they serve, what it is we're doing, why we're doing it, why it has to be done right now. As an example, early on there's a sequence where our hero pilots fly over to a Japanese airbase to bomb it. And again, having it be set in the Pacific, in of itself, it is pretty cool. All the cool visuals and explosions aside, the audience won't remember the sequence for more than two minutes into the next scene, because it is completely meaningless. We don't know why we're attacking this airbase, we don't know what we're attacking it for or what we're trying to accomplish by doing so. The entire sequence carries no consequences to the rest of the movie whatsoever. You could have just cut it out and the narrative would have played out the exact same way. In other words, it serves no purpose. Signal the fleet. Tell them it's time to haul ass with Halsey. Yes, sir. You heard the man. Signal the fleet. Destroying the Japanese airbase to protect the advancement of the USA ships is great, but then maybe first actually visually establish the airbase as a real threat to the ships instead of just casually mentioning it. Another good example is when we have this whole subplot of Aaron Eckhart bombing Tokyo and crash landing in China. We spend so much time on it and yet the bombing leads to nothing. The characters that do it just vanish from the movie altogether. And scene after scene the movie is filled with stuff exactly like this that serves no purpose. And that which serves no purpose is not memorable. The only memorable part about all of it is the confusion as to why we're seeing it in the first place. <laughs> Oh, by the way, as I started editing this video, I did realize why this Tokyo bombing and crashing in China subplot is in the movie. It's because a major part of its funding came from China, and obviously it's important to China to showcase how badly the Japanese treated them in that time. And in order to show that, we actually have to go to China. So, there you go. To give Midway some credit, this issue gets a lot better toward the end when we actually get to the Battle of Midway. Now everything is very clear and does serve a purpose. We have to destroy these 
few Japanese mega boats in order to stop them from taking over Midway, which is crucial to protecting the west coast of the US. But as to why we spend over half the movie on stuff that's clearly just narrative filler and time jumps, I don't know. It's not like in Dunkirk we spend an hour and a half just casually hanging out in France and only then try to get home at the end. That would make no sense. But as much as the end part of Midway does function narratively, there's still the problem of us having no human factor in those places we're trying to protect from the Japanese. We do hear people say that oh Midway is so important and whatnot, but we don't have a single properly developed character down there to explore it through to make it feel important. We don't even visit the US West Coast, so even though you say it's there and even though I guess we know it's there, it's not the same as us being there through character. At the beginning of Uncharted Lost Legacy, we spend a good amount of free time in this Indian city with a random girl for example. And the reason we do that is so that when we at the end are trying to stop the villain from delivering a bomb to that city, we actually feel what's at stake. We actually feel we need to stop him. Because we've been there to create feelings for the place and the people we're trying to protect. And so if you're basing the power of your entire plot on something you just say exists without ever actually showing it and making us feel for it, I don't think that's a plot we feel for or remember. I don't think that's a movie we feel for or remember.